Hello, this is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we continue in the Gospel of John, Chapter 8. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts will be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's remember that Jesus has been teaching groups of people on a number of subjects. And last time we saw that some of the people there believed in him. Verse 30. While he was saying these things, many believed in him. And if you remember, we started studying what we call the faith scale or scale of faith. Let me remind you something about that because we're going to refer to it again. This is a scale of faith. C-A-L, scale of faith. And if you remember, on the left side was the weak faith. On the right side was the strong faith. Now your faith strengthens the more you be obedient. So the next time you can be challenged for a stronger faith and believe something that's even harder. And so you grow stronger and stronger in your faith. Now we all have faith. But it's a matter are we going to keep using it and believing. And as we continue to believe, we get stronger in our faith, and this is where we want to be. Now, we called these people who believed in Jesus. We said what they had, we called it incipient faith. That's a new word if you haven't learned that. It means beginning faith, a new faith, just starting. They haven't went very far at all. They're very weak in their faith. And then we went and looked at Luke 8, which hopefully was a reminder of some of the basic things or first things you studied. We looked at the category one person. These are the, this is from the parable of the soils, okay, the different types of soils. The seed fell on the path. It didn't even hit the soil. And it got trampled under feet. And the birds ate it. So this person was over here. He never became a believer. So he was an unbeliever. Category two person, if you remember, the seed fell on the rock or on rocky soil. You know, if you got rocky soil, how's a seed going to take root? So there it sits on the rocks. It gets no moisture. It goes right past it down under the rocks. It never grows. In fact, it is said to wither up. But it is said to temporarily believe. So we call that person a temporary believer. They were a believer for a short time. They're described as receiving the gospel with joy, and they believe for a while. But what makes them turn away, if you remember that, let's put two up here. What makes them turn away is the uh, suffering and persecution when they're tested. And they turn away from the faith. The third category, you put them over here, category three. These fell among the thorns. They believed. Let's remember, they actually believed. They were solid in their belief. How do we know that? Because they even did some production. And you don't get to do production unless you've moved along in the faith a little bit. And they had. But what happened to them? They got distracted by worries, by pleasures, by the desire of things. And their production what they produced over here, well, 
they stopped producing. And they started going the other direction also. So their faith is weakening. And this is a sad case because they were on their way. But they lost their way. Perhaps they thought that this is going to cost them too much. Maybe they didn't want to give up their, their friends or their evil practices. And, and they decided, well, I either got to choose my friends and their evil practices or I'm going to get serious about being a Christian. And they decided to go the other way. So they go back over here, and over here is where immature believers are, baby believers are. A lot of believers are over here. The fourth category is the strong believer. That's the ones we like. That's the ones we want to be like. They're described as being good soil. Not thorny, not rocky, and not on the path. They're good soil. Jesus describes them in Luke 8, 15 as having a good heart. A good heart. Let's look at 8.15. This is part of the parable. But that in the good soil, these are the ones with an honest and good heart, have heard the word, keep holding on to it, and keep bearing fruit with perseverance. What are the three characteristics of the good soil? Can you tell me? First, if it's their heart, their heart's described as honest and good. And then they are described as holding on to the word. The third characteristic is they bear fruit with perseverance. So, the strong, growing believer, he has a good heart, we'll shorten it, has a good heart. He holds the word. That's the word of God. He holds the word and he bears fruit. That's a growing Christian. Now let's go back to our passage in John 8. And I want you to look at Luke 8, 15 one more time. Notice what I underlined. The word, they keep holding on to it. John 8, 31. We looked at this last time. We'll move through it rather fast. Then Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Notice, these are the ones with incipient faith. If you continue in my word. That's like holding on to it. If they would continue in the word, they would prove themselves to be disciples, students, followers of Jesus. And not only that, verse 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And we learned that that had to do with freedom from slavery to sin. So, they need to hold on to the word. They need to continue in the word to be disciples and be set free from sin. Then you remember what they said? Well, they said, verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you'll become free? Now, Jesus had been talking about freedom from sin. Now, he hasn't explained it yet, but this is what they're thinking. They're thinking about, hey, we're sons of Abraham. We're sons of the kingdom. We're not enslaved to anyone. How can you tell us you'll become free? They don't see themselves as slaves. But you see, Jesus is going to point out to them that they are slaves to sin. They live in that slave market of sin, and they need their freedom. And notice whose name they mentioned, Abraham. Father Abraham, the one who started the Jewish race. Since we are from Abraham's race, physical descendants or physical seed we're not enslaved to anyone you see they felt that because they were Jews that they were 
secure in their faith that they were not in slavery. You know, that's a lot that's a lot like churches today. People think they're in certain churches that they're good with God. There's a lot of churches like that, sadly, because I'm a Catholic, because I'm a Mormon, because I'm a Jehovah Witness, because I'm some other member of a church that I'm saved. You're only saved if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It has nothing to do with what church you're in. Okay? But these Jews were saying, hey, we're from Abraham. We don't need to be freed from anything. That's basically what they're saying. Listen to Jesus' next words. If you remember, we saw these last time. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So what Jesus is telling these Jews, Abraham's descendants, is that you're basically in a sale. Let's make this a sale. There they are slaves. They are slaves to sin. I'm going to put some prison bars over them just to make us understand. They're slaves to sin. Now Jesus tells them, uh, gives them an analogy. He gives them a parallel situation because he wants to teach them something. Listen to this. Verses 35 and 36. The slave does not remain in the household forever. The son does not. The son does remain forever. Let me say that again. The slave does not remain in the household forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Now if you remember, in a Roman household, they had their families and they had their slaves. They had people who were part of the household, and that can include a slave, someone who served in the family. But he's not a member of the family. He's not a permanent member of the household. He could be freed, he could be bought or traded, or he could buy his own freedom. He might earn his own freedom. But he's not a member of the household permanently. Only the son is. And that's the point of verse 35. The son does not remain in the household forever. The son does remain forever in the household, you see. And then verse 36. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Now here is where it appears that Jesus is making a change of the teaching. Once a son got old enough and he was declared an adult, they went through this ceremony. It's kind of like graduation from high school, but they were a lot younger than that. They were as young as maybe 12 or 13. He could make decisions as an adult, and the son in the household could free a slave. That's the point here. But now we take the son as what, as what Jesus is saying, and he, as God's son, can free people from slavery to sin. And that was the lesson there. Jesus takes this analogy and applies it to himself as the son who can set people free from being slaves to sin. So what they have learned, these people who thought they were not enslaved, are told, no, you're a slave to sin, but the Son can set you free. So that's two points they need to learn. Are they listening? Are they learning? Well, Jesus is going to talk to them about what they said being Abraham's descendants. Let's go over here. Jesus says in verse 37, 
I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now there's a contradiction here, but you probably don't know it unless you remember what I said last time. If you were a descendant of Abraham, a true descendant, remember you could be a descendant from Abraham in two different ways. You could be physical, which means he was, he was one of your great, 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 great grandfathers. We also call that a seed, and that's all Jews. Or you could be spiritual. I shouldn't say or. I could say you could be both. But Jesus is talking about spiritual. And that's someone who lives by faith. And this is all believers. A Jew could be a believer. Yes, he could. But so could a Gentile. But when Jesus says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you're trying to kill me. You seek to kill me. And he tells them why. Because my word has no place in you. Have you ever had a closet or a box or maybe a treasure chest that was so full of stuff you couldn't squeeze anything else in it? Often when we take a trip, it seems like the suitcase is never big enough. I don't care how big a suitcase, it always gets crammed all the way. That's kind of like these people's hearts. They didn't have room for the truth. They didn't have room for Jesus' truth. Why? Because now they're getting so full of sin and lust and even killer lust, murder lust, that they had no room for what Jesus was telling them in their heart. Now, here's what Jesus is letting them know. I know you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. So what we need to do, if these Jews over here wanted to kill Jesus, and they also have no place for truth. Yeah, they're still physical descendants, but they're not this at all, because believers love truth. When they say they're seeking to kill him, they keep themselves over on this side. Why would a true spiritual descendant seek to kill Jesus? So Jesus is exposing, he's showing them that they're not really acting like Abraham's descendants, the important one, faith. And if you know the story of Abraham, it was a story of a man of faith. And they're leaving out the biggest story, the biggest part of his life, out of their life. His was a life of faith. They're not that at all. So they just got this second-rate relationship, not the first-rate relationship of being a child of faith an imitator of Abraham's faith. Now, let's go back to these people that Jesus is talking to. Let's see if we can find them back here. There they are. They're right here. And they are rapidly moving away from truth, from Jesus, from living by faith. Now they don't want the word. Now they want to kill Jesus. And it just shows you, now listen to me, it just shows you how new believers can easily fall away from Christ. Now some would say, well, they never were believers. 
Well, it did say they believed in him, and they believed him, and then Jesus starts to talk to them, but they did not want any more truth from Jesus. So it's a tough call. Were they ever believers? It says they were, but then already they've turned away from Christ. That's why I like to say they were just incipient believers, which means that they believed, but it was so, so shallow that it didn't last at all. You might say that Jesus had them just for a short time, but now they can't stand what he's saying to them. Their hearts are closed. And Jesus says that you're a contradiction when you claim to be Abraham's descendants because you're not the important type of descendants that God's looking for. And how does he know that? Now listen to me, because they don't want the truth. And you're going to find that people who don't want the truth, who claim to be believers, don't expect them to be around long. Don't expect them to be living like Christians very long. They can learn to pretend. They can even come to church. But if they don't love the Word of God, if they're not growing in the Word, listen to this wisdom. Don't trust them. They can turn on you just like they turned on Jesus right here. These are the people that said they believed in him. Now they don't want to hear it. Now they're not making any room for the word of God in their life. They're not holding on to it. They're not continuing in it to be a disciple. They have no desire to be a disciple. Have you ever heard anybody say they don't want to be a disciple even though they say they're Christians? I have. It's rather a shock. But it shows you where their hearts really are or where they're turning. And these believers were at a point where they could move forward with Jesus, but they decided not to, and they shut down. And rather than fill their hearts and desires with truth and living for Christ, they are now full of sin, and some of that is to murder Jesus. Can you think of anyone else that could be well, let's put it this way. The worst person you'd want to murder is the Messiah? And I must say, it sounds crazy that they first believed in him, and now they're talking about killing him. No, who are you people? You know, they call that fickleness. You ever try to catch a cockroach? Not fun but they get out of here. This might drive my wife crazy. But they get out of here with their little sticky legs and their antennas and you try to catch them, they'll go this way, 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 and then they get away. They have to be real quick. They are fickle. They keep changing their mind. Of course, they're trying to survive. But that's the way sometimes people who say they're believers are. They don't know what to do with truth because they don't want it. So they turn on the one speaking it or living it or both. So learn this lesson. This type of incipient or shallow or weak faith can turn on Christians quickly. In fact, when we get into the tribulation period, a few years before our Lord returns at the second advent, as the Antichrist takes over and he rules the world, they have this period called the Great Persecution. And it's during this time that many people, many believers will fall away from Christ. They weren't strong in their faith. They hadn't grown in the word. They weren't ready for these great tests towards the Christian. And they went the other direction. Not only did they follow the Antichrist, not only will they follow the Antichrist, the Antichrist, not only will these former believers follow the Antichrist, 
but they'll start to join in on persecution of the Christians. They'll turn them in, even family members. Jesus spoke about that. They'll be betrayed by their own relatives. Learn that the rejection of truth results in hatred of Jesus. Continued hate wants to express it outwardly. They'll want to kill Jesus. They don't want to get in trouble, though, so what do they do? They'll end up going to the authorities and lying to them and bringing in false witnesses and false accusations. That happens to those who are faithful. They may happen to you. Have you ever been accused of something you didn't do as a Christian? You know you did the right thing? It may have been at school. It may have been with some of your friends or maybe on your ball team if you play ball of some sort. Well, Jesus goes on to teach about the Father and how one reflects his Father by what he does. Verse 38. I am telling you the things I have seen while with the Father, and you practice the things you have heard from your Father. Oh, boy. Let's go back. Let's see if we got this on here. I don't think I do. Okay, we'll go on. So, Jesus is going to talk about his father and their father. Jesus' father, we know, is God. So we're going to put Jesus right here. Now, the Jews, we're going to see them, first of all, claim Abraham as their father. Let's look at what Jesus says one more time. I'm telling you the things I have seen while with the Father. That's when he was God the Son in heaven before he came to earth. And remember the first line in the book of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Then it went on to say that Jesus was the Word. So Jesus as the word was with God and he tells them things that he had seen while he was with God and then he says you Jews you practice the things of your father let's just put down father here for them so Jesus tells them the things from his father. They practice the things from their father. Let's look at our verse one more time. Jesus says, I'm telling you the things I have seen while with the father. That's his father, God. And you practice the things you have heard from your father. Now, remember the Jews have just claimed that they were descendants of Abraham. That they are children of Abraham. So that's in a way of saying that Abraham was their father. Listen to what they say in verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Notice, they claim Abraham's our father. Jesus says, if you are Abraham's children, in other words, if he is your father, do the deeds of Abraham. So, let's put this in our chart. They claim, first of all, Abraham as their father. Jesus tells them, all right, if Abraham is your father, then you need to be doing the deeds. That's the same like practicing. Jesus already said they practiced the deeds of their father, didn't they? So understand, if they did the deeds, whoever's deeds they do, that's their father. If they do the deeds of Abraham, fine, that's his father. But what are they doing? What are they doing? Jesus is going to show them what their deeds are. Now remember, 
They prove who their father is by the deeds they do. You got it? They prove who their father is by the deeds they do. Jesus says, let me repeat it again, I'll underline it. If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But what are they doing? What are they doing? Jesus gives them a short summary of what they're doing in verse 40. But now you are seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. So what are their deeds? They're trying to kill Jesus, someone who told him the truth, truth that he heard from God. And then Jesus says, Abraham didn't do this. Jesus, I mean, excuse me, Abraham did not seek to kill the Messiah or even a prophet or people who told the truth. That wasn't the type of things Abraham did. You see what Jesus is getting at? If you're not doing the deeds of Abraham, how can you claim he's your father? They're seeking to kill Jesus. They're not living by faith at all. So Jesus has described himself, let me put it up here this way, as the one they want to kill, a man who's told you the truth, which you heard from God. And Abraham did not try to kill him. This wasn't the type of thing Abraham did. So Jesus is proving to them that if you were from Abraham, if he was your true father, your spiritual father, then you'd be doing his deeds, and you're not at all. Abraham never killed a prophet or a messenger of God, not at all. And Jesus says again, verse 41, listen to this. You are doing the deeds of your father, they said to him. We are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now, what's this one all about? Well, first of all, Jesus, the, Jesus is the one that says the first line. You are doing the deeds of your father. So Jesus is saying, you are doing deeds, and they're of your father. The, practice, the point is, who is their father? Now, we'll get to that later. But then they come back and say to Jesus, we're not born of fornication. Now, fornication is when a child is born from a man and a woman who are not married. All right? That's not the way to be born. And that shouldn't be done. So what they're saying is, we were not born of fornication. And maybe they had in mind that they didn't know where Jesus really came from. Uh, maybe they knew that Joseph and Mary were not married at the time that that she got pregnant with Jesus. And maybe they were bringing that up to Jesus, kind of thorn in his face, you know, wink, wink. Or they could be saying, no, we have a father. Uh, we're not born out of wedlock. We have a father. And then they tell him, they tell Jesus, we have one father, God. So what they're saying is, Either saying, we're not born like you, Jesus, without parents, without married parents. But we actually have a father. And who do they claim to be their father this time? God. They claim God. So now they're claiming God as their father. Now remember... Whose deeds are they doing? Jesus told them, you're not doing the deeds of Abraham because you're trying to kill me. So they eliminated, Jesus eliminated Abraham, right? Now they're claiming God. They're claiming God as their father. And they are convinced, now listen to me, they are convinced that as Jews in the physical line of Abraham, 
that they are pleasing God and doing the deeds he wants them to do. Well, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to eliminate God as their father. Listen to what he says. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come from God and am now here. For I have not come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Now Jesus is telling them that if God was your father, their deed would be to love Jesus. Why? Because God sent him, and he's right there before them. If they love God, and God sent Jesus, then naturally, they would love Jesus. Did you hear that? If they really thought that God was their Father, and they loved Him and obeyed Him, and God the Father sent His own Son, of course they would love Jesus. But they don't. We've already seen they wanted to kill Him. And Jesus says, For I have not come on my own initiative, but he who sent me. God the Father sent me, and you don't love me? So what is Jesus showing him now? God isn't their father either. Why? Because they hate Jesus. And by the way, don't miss this. One of the indicators of people who reject Jesus is they do not want truth just the opposite over here believers over here keep the word they continue in the word because that's how you grow that's how you follow Jesus you see Jesus has been very open and straight with this crowd he has laid down the facts. He has presented to them that they are slaves to sin, that their claim to Abraham as their father is only in physical descent, not in spiritual descent. Their claim that God is their father is not true at all, and both Abraham and God are proven to not be their father by their deeds. And their deeds is to hate Jesus and his truth. If their hearts were open, they would have believed Jesus. But since their hearts are not, they won't. They had one of the greatest opportunities to show their love for God by trusting in the one he sent. And they wouldn't do it. There's a big lesson here. There are people out there in many religions and maybe just walk on the street that say, Oh, I just love God. Isn't God wonderful? How do you tell if someone really loves God? If someone loves God, we know that that also means obey. If someone loves God, then what? They will love Jesus. And if you love Jesus, you're going to follow him. You're going to trust him. You're going to believe in him. Well, remember where these believers started. I call them believers because they are, at most, incipient believers. So now they've turned all the way around away from Christ to wanting to kill him. Now this is an important lesson for you to learn. People who claim to be believers who don't love Jesus, don't obey God, don't be fooled by them. The more these people heard about Jesus at a certain point, the more they, the more they rejected him. There's no commitment. There's no giving themselves over to Christ. 
There's no continuing in the word. There's no keeping the word. In fact, they are too busy rejecting the word and they have no place for it in their hearts. Listen to verse 43 as we close out our lesson. Jesus says, Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you are not able to hear my word, which means accept. They don't understand what Jesus is saying because they don't want to accept it. I'll say it again. They don't want to hear what Jesus is saying because they don't want to accept it. Have you ever seen anyone like that? In this area of town, when people do that, they often get real loud. They don't hear the truth you have to say. They get really loud and say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't you tell me that. You're not that way. And they go on and on and on. They drown you out with their loud voice because they don't want to hear the truth. So they're never going to understand what you're saying. And that's the way it is with God's word. People who do not want it will not understand it. Why would God explain it to them in the words of a, a Bible teacher or in those days, Jesus or prophet, if they're not going to accept it? And the word for not able, it means they're incapable of it. It's like, they're broke. Uh, what we call their spiritual faculties. They're shut down. What they're supposed to be listening to the word with, as the word comes into them, the truth, they've got it all shut down. Blocked off by sin, by lust, by the world, by worry, whatever it is. And they're not going to understand the truth and it never will get through. Because they have chosen to shut it down. And this is their choice right here. They did this to themselves. And what they do when they do this, they put, them, they put themselves further into slavery of sin. And now they got to fill their lives up with sin. So it's sin, 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 sin until their heart gets so dark. They're so darkened, they can't accept the truth. And they're pretty much goners, pretty much goners. They're incapable of grasping the words of Christ, even when he's standing there right before them. So where do we go from here? Jesus has eliminated Abraham as their father and God as their father. But he's also said, you do the deeds of your father. So who is their father? Big question. Who is their father? Well, all you got to do is read the next verse. But we're going to learn that their father is the devil. They do his deeds proven by them wanting to hate Jesus. And kill him. And this is where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Father, it's been a very challenging lesson, an important one for all of us of all ages. We ask that we'll take these things that we've learned today to believe them and apply them and put them together in our thoughts and memories so that we can not only build upon what knowledge we've learned but understand that the world out there is made up of so many people who need Jesus, but who choose to reject him. And Father, might we, might we take every opportunity to tell our friends, our family, people we come to meet, maybe sitting in a doctor's office, wherever it may be, and tell them about Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.